Um, good morning and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the September APA Justice Meeting. My name is Jeremy Wu, and I'll be moderating today's meeting with a lot of help from Professor Stephen Pei and Vincent Wang. My role as facilitator is to keep the meeting on schedule, facilitate Q&A, and transition from speaker to speaker and from item to item. We're scheduled to end the call at around 1 p.m. Eastern time. To stay on time, I may be rude and apologize in advance if I must interrupt because the allotted time is running out. We are recording today's meeting to help prepare a summary. Some portions of today's meeting may be posted publicly with the per speaker's permission. The written meeting summary will be posted at apajustice.org after the speakers have a chance to review it. Otherwise, the monthly meetings are off record. Please raise your questions using the Q&A feature on your Zoom screen. We will try to address them during and at the end of the meeting as time permits. We have several new speakers today. We'll lead off with comments from Professor Aming Hu, his wife Ivy, and attorney Phil Lomonaco. I believe all of you have heard of the great news that Professor Hu was acquitted of all charges last Thursday. He's the first academic to go to trial under the China Initiative. Professor Hu is courageous in standing up for his innocence and justice. He was defended superbly by Phil. Welcome, Aming, Ivy, and Phil. We also have the distinct honor of Congressman Andy Kim speaking to us today. Congressman Kim was first elected to the U.S. House of Representatives in 2018. He represents the third congressional district of New Jersey. As a member of the House, Congressman Kim serves on the House Armed Services Committee, the House Foreign Affairs Committee, and the House Committee on Small Business. Prior to serving in the House, Congressman Kim worked as a career public servant. He served at USAID, the Pentagon, the State Department, the White House National Security Council, and in Afghanistan as an advisor to Generals Petraeus and Allen. Congressman Kim is a member of KPAC. Welcome, Congressman Kim. Our third new speaker today is Mary McAlpin, distinguished professor of the humanities and professor of French at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. She's also the president of UTK chapter of American Association of University Professors. Professor, Mary, uh, professor McAlpin will address how Dr. Hu's case is viewed by the faculty at the University of Tennessee. Welcome, Mary. Our fourth new speaker today is Professor Andrea Liu. She is Hepburn Professor of Physics at the University of Pennsylvania. She's also the past speaker of the, House, uh, of the Council of the American Physical Society. Professor Liu will tell us about an important webinar hosted by APS it is titled Effects of Federal Immigration Policy on U.S. Science and All Scientists. Welcome, Andrea. And as usual, Nisha and Gisela return as our regular speakers to update us from KPAC and Advancing Justice, AAJC. So as you can see, we have a full agenda today and many distinguished speakers. So let's get started. Uh, Phil, um, will you lead off with your comments to be followed by Ivy and then the conclude by Aming? The floor is yours. Thank you, Jeremy. I appreciate uh, being here. And I'm glad to see all the people that have shown so much interest and provided so much help to Professor Hu and his family through this trying times. As you're aware, we've 
we've moved through the case and uh, through many blessings we have prevailed. And um, it, it was really something that the, uh, that the case uh, had such twists and turns to it. But with the Ming being one of the, or being the first to go to trial on the uh, Chinese initiative, it was so important to have a good outcome. And we, could, we couldn't ask for anything better. Uh, the judge right from the beginning was open um, I think he looked at some of our, our post our pre pretrial motions where we set out the facts and our arguments and I think he was open to wait to see the evidence at trial to see if it, it what we said in our papers really came came true through the witnesses testimonies at trial and his his memorandum opinion uh, granting our rule 29 motion tracked the trial very well. He was very much um, on point with everything he said. He paid attention to everything. And um, basically what he did is he found there was no evidence um, by a preponderance of the evidence even that, or there was no, excuse me, there was no, no evidence to convince a reasonable juror that a Ming who was guilty. So given the evidence in a light most favorable to the government, which professor or which the uh, judge had to find, even, even looking at their evidence uh, most favorably, he found that they did not provide sufficient evidence of guilt. First of all, the evidence of whether professor who intended to deceive NASA, um, he found under two, two reasons why Professor Hu was innocent of the um, wire fraud. The first being that there was insufficient evidence to show that um, he intended to deceive NASA or fraudulently represent a material fact to NASA, that there was no satisfactory evidence to prove that. And second of all, one of the theories we uh, propounded was that there was no damage or he did not intend to um, injure NASA. The case law we found supports the theory that if you are, if, if NASA is not damaged, in other words, if Professor Hu was not taking property or money from NASA or intended to take property or money from NASA, then he could not be convicted of wire fraud. And it was an interesting case. The jurist that wrote the opinion that held that if there's no harm, there's no foul, so to speak, um, was sitting, it was a district court judge sitting by designation out of Kentucky. And now that district court judge is on the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals. So it, it would have been Judge Varland's boss uh, if he dis disagreed with that theory. So that was that was another blessing that, that God provided to us. Um, so without the, the proof that Professor Hu knowingly and intentionally tried to deceive NASA, then the, th the last three counts being false statements were not supported by the evidence either because if he didn't intend to deceive NASA, he didn't intend to make a false statement. So the judge believed there was insufficient evidence for that. And under rule 29, he granted an acquittal on all, all six counts of the indictment. The last email I received from the government was that they were still trying to figure out their appeal options, which I don't think they have any, but we'll see what they say here. They've got a few days to, to absorb what has happened and a few days to make a statement officially in court if they're going to. But again, um, we are really happy for Ming. He's been a trooper all the way through this. He wavered not a bit uh, on going forward to, to, to prove his innocence. And that's the kind of client I like, the ones that are innocent, although it's the most stressful type of representation. But I wish all my clients had two PhDs. Uh, it would be a lot more helpful. 
And I'll, with that, I'll turn it over. Thank you, people. Ivy, would you um, follow Phil, please? Yes. Um, thank you uh, for having me here. I really want to use this valuable opportunity to express the sincere gratitude from my three children, myself, and including Amin, to people, to organizations, for your strong and relentless support when we, ex when we were experiencing the darkest time in our lives. Your support comforted us and inspired us to fight against injustice with determination and faith. Amin's case made me see very clearly that history is made by people who are the true patriots of this country. Firstly, uh, our beloved attorney, a wise and humble man. I'm not going to name his name. You all know him. He made the history. History was also made by Jamie Satterfield. I don't know her personally, but her coverage of the case let the whole world know the other side of the case that the government would not review and hope to be silenced. History was also made by Judge Valen. I don't think I can thank him in person, but his judgment made me regain the hope and belief for the USA, for its independent justice system and strong face of democracy. History was also made by the congressman, woman, by APA Justice, AAJC, United Chinese Americans, Committee of Concerned Scientists, AA Scholar Forum, AA University of Professors, Tennessee Chinese American Alliance, and many more. I, I haven't mentioned here, and please uh, forgive me. By the brave, uh, also made by the brave professors who choose to express their concerns and urge dismissal of the case publicly. History was also made by all of you, known or unknown to us, who believe in the justice and are willing to fight for it when it was jeopardized by the wrong ideologies. My thank you list is endless, I would say. Everyone who donated to us, encouraged us and watched the case closely. You provided the strength for us to continue the fighting. Uh, I mean, it's ordinary in my eye, is ordinary passionate scientist who only wanted to perform his research and to contribute his talents to the academic world. What has happened in the past year and a half has since damaged his career and reputation that was built over many years of tremendous, unbelievable hard work. Although his life and ours have been forever changed and we are not sure, unsure of what future holds, we will be forever thankful for the selfless actions of the individuals who believed and supported us throughout the entire journey despite the back backlash, oppression, and clear injustice. And again, thank you everyone here. Thank you, Ivy. Would you, um, Anmin, would you like to uh, finish up uh, your, your comments? Uh... Yeah, yeah. Thanks to the Dr. Wu and also the Professor the, the Pei uh, invited me and uh, give me a chance to speak. So please forgive me uh, if my words are too brief. So it's actually uh, too challenging for me to find the proper word to deeply appreciate so the help from all of you. I felt what you did, what you, uh, 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 what you have done far beyond whatever I can say thanks. Uh, on the other hand, the scars and the painful memory still there in my heart. For now, so I prefer to remain silent and I'm uh, thanks. So my lawyer, Mr. The Film Amodico can speak on behalf of me and also Ivy can uh, speak on behalf of my family. Thanks you all so much. Thank you. Thank you, Anming, Ivy, and Phil. Um, and congratulations again. Um, at this point, let me try to adjust the schedule a little bit. Um, Congressman Kim is under a very tight schedule. So Nisha, if it's okay, let me invite uh, the Congressman to speak at this point. And uh, 
Uh, I understand that he would allow for some uh, Q&A session. And um, Congressman, if uh, you don't mind, uh, please take the floor. Yeah, thank you. Um, well, th thank you all. And I'll, I'll try to keep my comments brief. And I know uh, we got a lot of great speakers here. So I'm, I'm, I'm proud to be a part of this team. Um, I'm, I'm really glad that we were able to hear from the three of them before, um, because it really just gives this tangible, very specific understanding of what we're facing. I want to just kind of use this as an opportunity to take a step back from that um, and, and place it in sort of in a broader context. What we're talking about here in a broader sense is this questioning as a country of how we confront these ideas of loyalty and trust and how we confront this idea of who belongs in this country and who is an American, who is someone who is here and who has opportunities uh, to be able to seek uh, the fullness of what it means to be here in this nation. Uh, that goes beyond just any individual case. You know, for me, I, th I think about it through my own lens um, that, you know, roughly about nine, 10 years ago, I was working for the United States State Department. I was a diplomat for the United States at the time. And I remember I, I served out in Afghanistan. I put myself in harm's way for this country. But when I came back to the United States, I remember I was working there at, in D.C. and there was a letter at my desk one day and I opened up this letter and read it and what it was, it was this letter informing me that I've now been banned from working on issues related to Korea uh, because I'm Korean American. And I was not applying to work on anything related to Korea. This was a preemptive and proactive effort, letting me know that while I was in Afghanistan, my country had suspicions about whether or not I would be able to take on the full measure of the roles uh, at the State Department. And, and it was a very, um, it's, it's, it's such a devastating experience, you know, having this moment because I had already gone through multiple security checks before. Uh, I abided by all these different protocols. Uh, and to have this on top of that, this idea that they, they still just didn't trust me uh, was, was hurtful. And I remember I tried to find a way to, to appeal it. And I was told that there was no such way for me to do so at that time. And uh, I was told by people to just, you know, move on and ignore that it had happened. But I felt like it was this kind of stain on my reputation, um, you know, this uh, inability for me to prove to uh, others that I should be allowed to do whatever job that any other American can do at the State Department, despite my last name. And, you know, as a Korean American confronting what it means to be in foreign policy as we have uh, undoubtedly challenges when it comes to the Korean Peninsula, no doubt. And as I'm married to a Chinese American, uh, and we now enter this new era that we're all talking about here about what happens next. As we know, and I feel it every day in the Armed Services Committee and the Foreign Affairs Committee that I'm on in Congress, that we are entering this era where we are much more uh, dominated by this thinking about what is the US relationship to China. And in that question, we not only need to think about what that relationship will look like, but we have to think about how that's going to affect people around the world, but in particular, people here in the United States, and in particular, Asian Americans, Chinese Americans, and how that's going to inter interact. So the experiences that we're talking about, the professor's experience, uh, of my experience, which you know pales into comparison to what the professor and others have had to experience, but undoubtedly still gives a lens at it. What we need to th be aware of is, is understanding all the different manifestations that this type of questioning of loyalty and questioning of trust will, uh, will, will foster and find the different tools that we have at our disposal, whether legal or cultural or educational or what, to try to combat this and try to make sure that we do not have people drawn under the kind of suspicion uh, that, that, that we fear. So I just wanted to place it in that broader context and let you know that certainly for me, I'm doing everything I humanly can in Congress to draw from these experiences, draw from what I'm hearing from others uh, to try to find uh, the best ways that we can move forward. Uh, there's, I, I make no promises that I can, I can solve every single element of this, but I want to work with all of you and pull our minds together and think about, you know, what are the different things that we can accomplish and, and really try to make sure that, uh, you know, we move forward. You know, I got a four-year-old and a six-year-old 
grown up here in this country. And I'm, I'll be honest, I'm worried about what kind of world they're growing up into. Two, you know, Korean and Chinese American baby boys growing up in this era. Um, and I want to make sure that I do everything I can to be able to deliver a fair, just and equal society for them and give them the opportunities that they deserve. So with that, I just hope that context places it in a broader frame and appreciate the opportunity to be able to share that with you. Thank you very much, uh, Congressman. Um, indeed, you can see all the applause that you're receiving. <laughs> um, um, at this point, I, I'd like to transition to Nisha uh, so that uh, you can give us an update from uh, KPAC. Sure, thank you, Jeremy. Um, I, I wanna just start, I will have a pretty quick update for you. I know we have a lot of speakers still left to go, um, but wanna uh, thank Congressman Kim for, for everything you just mentioned. Um, KPAC is happy to continue supporting uh, the work that you're doing in these spaces. And um, just as, as a follow on to, uh, to Congressman Kim's remarks, uh, just also wanna uh, remind everyone here and happy to circulate that as well that uh, KPAC um, and KPAC leaders, including uh, Congressman Kim, did send out uh, message and guidance around um, anti-China rhetoric that's being used uh, to all members of Congress um, earlier last month, actually. And so happy to, to recirculate that. I know we talked about it a little bit at last month's meeting, um, but as we're talking about and thinking about these issues, uh, KPAC, as many of you are, are very aware um, that how we talk about our communities, how we uh, you know, the words that we use really matter. It's something we've seen specifically since, um, you know, through, throughout this, this pandemic over the last year and a half, uh, the words that our, our elected officials are using, the way we talk about our communities matters. And so um, we are continuing on the KPAC end to, um, to work with, with committees and with uh, folks that are, that are writing legislation, especially through these next couple of weeks um, and wherever we see, you know, um, language that is that is outside of the scope of you know what what their bills are trying to do and and we see this anti-china anti specific language especially i have been working really hard on trying to address those um with community staff so wanted to just give that quick update um i have two other kind of pieces to 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 point out on our end first we'll uh just want to congratulate dr who again and, and family um on 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 the acquittal and you know from uh, set, bring my uh, regards from Chairwoman Chu as well. Uh, she's very, very thrilled to hear this news. And so, um, you know, extends her support uh, as well to you all uh, and and uh, your, her congrats as well. Um, we'll flag for everyone and I'll put it in the chat. We did put out a statement um, where we had a couple of our KPAC members um, also weighing in um, with their congrats as well. Oops, I will put that in the chat. Uh, for you all here. Um, uh, I know this is this is certainly not the end of what we're seeing out of the China initiative. And so on KPAC's end, continuing to push for, for the end to that initiative. Um, Peter, we received uh, your letter as well. Um, so appreciate, appreciate that. And um, we'll also add that it's something that is high on our list to address when we do uh, eventually have a meeting with um, the Attorney General and folks, the Department of Justice, but it's something that we've raised uh, frequently with our, our friends in the White House and um, our friends at the Department of Justice as well, that KPAC stands firmly behind ending the China Initiative as well. Um, the last piece I just wanted to quickly address, I know it's been uh, a little over uh, a week now since we since we got the, the results of the, um, the ITMS investigation that was happening at the Department of Commerce. And uh, on our end, certainly welcome the decision to eliminate this uh, this rogue unit, but also wanted to to flag that we've heard, you know, certainly have heard concerns and through seeing the report um, that people have about specifics around what was found in that report, particular to uh, you know their findings around national origin and race. And so um, we'll just add that while we're still working to schedule on a staff level, we'll be working with um, with the Department of Commerce on a staff level briefing so we can ask a few more detailed questions while we're generally overall happy with, with the result. And so I will also put that um, statement that we made last two Fridays ago now uh, in the chat for you all. Those are kind of the big issues uh, on our end, but 
certainly working closely with Jeremy, working with this um, whole coalition and um, uh, looking forward to, to continuing that work. Happy to take any uh, questions you may have, but otherwise uh, we'll continue to update you as things move forward. Thank you very much, uh, Nisha. Uh, we'll um, defer any questions to the uh, Q&A session near the end of the meeting. Uh, we'll move at this point to uh, uh, Mary. Um, Mary, would you take the floor for about 10 minutes and tell us a little bit about uh, AAUP and the views of the faculty on Dr. Hu's case? Absolutely, um, and I just want to thank APA Justice for inviting me and Jeremy and Stephen for spending time speaking with me over the past few weeks. Um, also for uh, all their work against the China Initiative and their work um, for my ex-colleague An Ming Hu. And I say ex-colleague with the hope and expectation that I will be able to remove the ex from that at some point in the near future and that he will again be my, my faculty colleague here at the University of Tennessee. Um, so as, as Jeremy said, when he introduced me, I'm the, the president of our local chapter of the American Association of University Professors. Um, and that is a group that um, doesn't just look into questions of tenure, but also the protection of non-tenure track faculty and including graduate teaching assistants. Um, it's a national organization. We're just the local chapter. I'm a professor of 18th century French literature and culture. My legal training is absent, <laughs> completely minimal. But um, I must say that uh, uh, I, I do want to talk a little bit about uh, how faculty have been speaking about this case. Um, Jeremy is right about Jamie Satterfield's influence. I, for example, the first I heard of this case was when I read some of Jamie's articles in the local newspaper, the Knoxville News Sentinel. Um, and at that point, people started posting a lot in our listserv, our AUP listserv, which is Voxprof. What's going on? What happened? Is AUP looking into this? What is the administration doing? Um, and um, a lot of people were, were quite upset, but also very confused. This is an incredibly complicated case, um, although it comes down to the very, a very simple um, injustice, but uh, trying to figure out what happens through reading these things. Uh, people were most concerned about three things. The first was the FBI investigation and how it seemed to be a travesty of justice, which in fact is what the judge finally concluded. Um, and UT's complicity with this investigation, which was also covered in Jamie Satterfield's um, article. She has one particular article where she goes into detail about how the UT administration responded to this case. Um, and what I found in that is rather horrifying, although not particularly surprising to me as someone who's in her 26 year as a professor at UT, um, because uh, the, the university is a giant bureaucratic entity and it protects itself. I mean, if you think as an employee of the University of Tennessee that the university is, is there to help you and protect you and somebody like an FBI agent comes calling, then you will be sadly mistaken. I've seen this several times over the course of my career, but never in such an egregious fashion as we saw with um, Ming Hu. It's, um, it's, it's, it's really shocking. Um, so the third issue that people talked about, and this is the one that I wanna go into a little bit of detail about, um, is the government's targeting of international faculty and who are because of their status as international faculty, particularly vulnerable to losing their employment at UT, which is exactly what happened with Dr. Hu. Um, and so I want to talk a bit about um, that and uh, just say that there are many, many, of course, international faculty working at the University of Tennessee. I'm in a department of modern foreign languages and literatures. Many of my colleagues are here on green cards or H-1B visas. And I can only imagine that they're following this very closely, but probably not speaking out the way that I can as a a citizen of the United States, born in the United States, and possessing tenure, which is extremely important. Not only that, closer to the end than the beginning of my career. So I have no problem speaking out whatsoever. And I just have to say that I, I feel as if on some level I'm speaking for those who, who might be afraid to, to speak up, um, particularly uh, people, uh, employees who are not citizens at the University of Tennessee. And I just want to say that when the when the acquittal came through last Thursday, 
we fully expected the administration to say, this is great, we shall now reinstate Doctor Who, <laughs> and uh, with back pay, and I mean, we as a local chapter, the AUP actually sent a, an email to Provost Stomchik saying, um, we were thrilled to hear the news. We hope soon to hear that Doctor Who will be reinstated with back pay and perhaps additional monies for the emotional damage inflicted by, by this being suspended without pay, et cetera, et cetera. That is not what happened. Apparently, the university is expecting Doctor Who to demonstrate proof that he is able to work in the United States before they will rehire him. Um, the Faculty Senate is leading on this uh, case and trying to figure out what exactly is going on with the reinstatement. Of course, a lot of legal issues are involved. Um, um, so I can't really speak to the legality of what happened. I can say that the provost has said that in every case, uh, every situation surrounding this case, the UT administration followed both the letter and the spirit of the faculty handbook. And I can assure you that even if the letter was followed, I have no idea whether it was, the spirit of the faculty handbook was not followed in this case. And this is why I say that. Uh, from what I can piece together, um, Doctor Who was uh, indicted by the federal government. And at that point, the UT administration put him first on paid and then on unpaid suspension. The UT administration, according to the faculty handbook, did not have to put Doctor Who on unpaid suspension. He could have been reassigned to another uh, job in which any whatever suspicions that were surrounding him because of the indictment were not in play. They did not do that. They chose, and this was a choice, to put Doctor Who on unpaid uh, leave. So then, because Doctor Who was on unpaid leave, he no longer qualified for the H-1B visa with which he was working, at which point they fired Doctor Who, not for cause, but because he did not have an H-1B visa, which he did not have, because they had suspended him without pay, which they did not have to do. <laughs> and so surely when they suspended him without pay, they knew that this would cause the revocation of the H-1B visa, which meant that they basically triggered their own ability to fire Dr. Who because they did not want to deal with the legal fallout of, of the indictment. And, and they panicked as Jamie Satterfield has detailed in her articles when the FBI investigation hit. And so now, from what I understand, Provost Somchik is saying, we will rehire you, but you have to prove that you are eligible to work in the United States, which would mean having a visa, which was lost precisely because the UT administration suspended Dr. Who without pay. So when you have this, uh, this catch-22 Kafka-esque situation, and the faculty at UT um, are not going to let this uh, just go by. I, I imagine what the administrative wants is for Doctor Who to just go away uh, and not ask for back pay um, and, and just, I don't know what, go back to Canada, keep his mouth shut. Um, but, and whatever Doctor Who decides to do with his lawyers, that's not my business. But I can say that UT faculty members, especially the local chapter, the AUP, and I imagine the faculty senate, we're not going to stop pushing on this. This is a clear travesty of justice, and it's being continued even after the acquittal, unfortunately, at the level of the university. And if we don't speak up, especially the tenured faculty members, then we don't deserve tenure. Um, and that's basically all I have to say. And congratulations to Dr. Who, and I hope again to be able to call you my colleague at the University of Tennessee very soon. <laughs> Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you, Mary, very much. And uh, please stay. And I'm sure that there'll be some questions for you during the uh, Q&A session. Um, Andrea, um, would you at this point take uh, maybe about five minutes and, and tell us about this important, very important um, webinar that's coming up and is sponsored by the American Physical Society? Yes, Andrea. thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Jeremy, um, and thank you for your support of this. I want to start out by first just pointing out the importance of professional societies in advocating for us on visa issues and, and immigration issues, and um, especially scientific 
um, or as, as professional societies in STEM when it comes to cases um, involving the China Initiative. Um, I am the past speaker at the Council of the American Physical Society, which represents uh, 55,000 um, physicists, 45,000 of more than 45,000 of, of them in the US. Um, and the APS has really taken a very strong stance on on uh, immigration, visa immigration issues, and also the China Initiative. Um, and I just wanna give you an idea of what a professional society can do. So for example, um, I don't know if you remember, but last summer, uh, the Trump administration uh, was thinking of canceling F1 and M1 visas for students um, who are studying off campus due to the pandemic. And uh, the APS actually filed an amicus brief in support of the Harvard and MIT uh, when they requested um, an injunction against this and um, organized other professional societies to join in. Um, and you know, um, that, that was successful. Um, they also lobbied the State Department. The APS has a very active Office of Government Affairs and lobbied the State Department successfully to, depend, to defend the J-1 and OPT, um, um, which the administration was thinking of suspending um, for all of STEM um, and, uh, and managed to protect H-1Bs for those who are already in, in the US. So, you know, scientific societies uh, and all professional society, societies really have an important role to play. Um, in defense of this, they actually put together a report with personal statements from members talking about what, how the J-1 had benefited them and benefited the U.S. Um, and OPT also. Um, and more recently, just, just last week, they, they wrote a letter to the Department of Justice and the Office of Science and Technology Policy at the White House. Um, about the China Initiative. Um, um, so, you know, I think it's really important for all of us to get involved with our professional societies, uh, optimally at the highest levels where we can actually influence policy because that's an important way for us to get our voices out. Um, so, and this is what we've been doing at the APS. Uh, so to get to the webinar, so, so the webinar will be on Friday, 2 to 4 p.m. Eastern time. There is a link in the email uh, for with containing the agenda for this meeting. Um, and I urge you all to register for it um, and uh, attend if you can and, and ask questions. Um, so it will feature Steve Chu, um, who won the Nobel Prize for laser trapping of atoms and was Secretary of Energy in the Obama in administration. Uh, John Kim, who is a tech entrepreneur and uh, was president of Bell Labs and is now CEO of Kisway Mobile about his immigration experience. Um, and those are very inspiring stories, except we will also then have personal statements from people now. Uh, where the climate has really changed and where people don't feel very welcome in the US and are worried about being here. And, and um, this will have a huge impact. It not only has a huge impact on science and the US's uh, dominant position in science, but it has a tremendous human cost. And the human cost uh, for, for immigrants here is is really what we hope to convey through this webinar. We've also put together a toolkit um, in collaboration with the Asian American Scholars Forum um, on how to put pressure on universities to support scientists who are collaborating uh, internationally um, instead of you know, abandoning them, as we have just heard happen with An Min Hu's case. Um, so uh, we put together a toolkit with a template letter and suggestions for how to proceed to put maximum pressure uh, that, so faculty can put maximum pressure on their universities. So, um, and that will be that, there, that 
a link to that will be provided along with the webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. Um, APA Justice definitely is one of the strong supporters for this uh, webinar, and we will um, distribute the uh, webinar information through the newsletter, through the social media, and uh, make sure that uh, within our ecosystem, our network, people get the word about the uh, webinar. And again, thank you, and uh, uh, please stay for the Q&A session. We will run a little bit over time today. Uh, and Gisela, I know you have been very patient. Uh, so do you mind if uh, take, you take the floor at this point and uh, tell us more about the uh, recent activities of uh, Advancing Justice AAJC? Thank you so much, Jeremy, and thank you everyone for your great work. It's, it's great to see such leadership within the academic community. Um, in terms of on our end, I think what I want to really discuss is what are the next steps? What are the next steps for organizations, community groups, and concerned uh, members? One is first just on the messaging when it comes to Professor Aming Hu's case. I did want to clarify that, um, you know, I, I recommend that organizations and folks really focus on the correctness of the judge's ruling, how it's reasonable, and the importance of the judicial role when there is government overreach. I do want to clarify that the biggest issue here has always been that under the China Initiative, we are concerned that the Department of Justice and this administration has overreached. And that is always going to be a top talking point. Second, as even as we have this acquittal from the judge, we should lift up the harm that Professor Hu has suffered. Um, they, Mary has done an excellent job highlighting employment and financial ramifications. But when we think about this case and how it could have ended up in terms of just immigration consequences, there, it, it, this was very serious. Um, and, and this is something that we're seeing, not just with Professor Hu's case, but across the country. And so we want to lift up um, that these harms don't end just with an acquittal. And we also want to lift up with the, our allies who aren't as aware of the China Initiative. This week is the 9-11 uh, commemoration. Uh, it commemorates the lives lost during the 9-11, but also two decades of criminalization of Asian Americans, particularly those who are Arab, Middle Eastern, Muslim, and South Asian. What we see as a pattern here against the Asian American community and as Jeremy highlighted in terms of this perpetual foreigner narrative is that Asian Americans go through the cyclical event where whenever our country has an issue with another country, we're treated as national security threats. Uh, so this isn't new. We saw this with post 9-11, instead of economic espionage, there was terrorism claims. So when we are this week, Asian Americans Advancing Justice is going to be working with We Are Home for their week of action and with the Arab American Institute. And we're lifting up issues that Muslim communities have faced. And a lot of this will sound familiar to many of you. Surveillance, travel bans, xenophobic hate crimes, profiling, criminalization under the China initiative and unjust prosecutions. So we think this is a really unique opportunity as we see how We Are Home Week of Action handles this during 9-11. How can we connect this with the China initiative so we can broaden support our brothers and sisters who face this, but also broaden the support and understanding on our goal to one, end the Department of Justice China initiative, but as Congressman Andy Kim mentioned, broadly to end racial profiling that we're seeing across federal agencies that are specifically targeted towards Asian American federal employees. So even if you're an American citizen, you are still potentially a target for the government because of this narrative that you're a perpetual foreigner, that you are potentially a national security threat. So I will um, share with Jeremy some of the events that are coming up with this week of action. It will be ending in um, later this in September with a webinar that we're doing with the Arab American Institute. And that focuses on prosecutions and surveillance of AMEMSA communities and Chinese Americans and immigrants. So it'll follow post 9-11 and also the Trump era China initiative. Um, following that in October, we're going to do a week in the end of October where we do legislative visits 
Um, I want to highlight that when we work, all, all of our various community organizations to garner support for Representative Lou's letter to the Attorney General, we had a standing support in Congress that was 90 signatories, but it was predominantly in the House. We see that there's still a lot of effort that we need to make in the Senate and also with other House committee, uh, with other committees who want to do more work on this issue. So I invite everyone to please contact me. We want to work with a coalition of both national and local organizations, provide you with the training materials that you need so that we can go strong in the end of October, have at least 30 plus um, offices that we visit focus on the Senate to really educate them on this issue and not just with the Department of Justice China initiative, but with all the different federal agencies that we're seeing here. We want you in your local area to be the lead. You are the constituent. We are here to support you and give you the materials that you need. And so if this is something of interest to you, um, please shoot me an email. Um, I'll let you know about our trainings. I'll provide you with the materials that you need and we'll coordinate so that your particular group has good variety. And when I mean about good variety, there's someone in your local area, there's someone who can speak on the direct impact, but there's also a national organization who can speak about the broader issues that concern the Asian American community. Um, this is a really opportune time for us to really push um, the Biden administration, our policymakers on this issue, and it is one where it benefits all of us to do it in a really cohesive and collaborative manner. So we're happy to work with everyone, empower you to speak with your members of office. Um, just shoot me an email and let me know if you have any questions. Thank you all. Thank you, Gisela and uh, AJC for your continuing leadership in tackling racial profiling and, and related justice and uh, fairness issues. And um, for, for the Asian American community and beyond, beyond. And also congratulations, you're now the uh, staff attorney uh, at the uh, AJC. So uh, at this point, I like to mention that um, Congressman Jamie uh, Raskin is invited to speak in the next meeting in October. Um, he is interested, as you, some of you know, and um, he is a member of the uh, January 6th uh, commission. So he has a conflicting uh, uh, meetings on Mondays. So that means that our October meeting may be moved to a Tuesday possibly October 5th, and we're working with the, his staffers at this point. Uh, so it may be a day um, after uh, the, the uh, regularly scheduled uh, Monday. Um, I, I know we're running a little bit over time. So for those who can stay, we will have a Q&A session at this point. And, um, and, and hopefully many of you can join 